Oh, sweet. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Author Content. Uh, after much contention, we have landed on the fact that this is, in fact, episode <laughs> 60, not 59 or 58. Right. Wow. Or happened to you. So, uh, now Ray and I are in agreement about version numbers, and I have to go back and change some names of some previous episodes just to make sure that we're actually counting which is, properly. Which is why we need version control on this show. <laughs> and we're gonna talk, James is going to talk about that later on. Yes. Oh, great. My name, as always, is Morton. With me today, I have my two co-hosts, James Williamson. Hello. And Ray Vigilobos. Howdy. And we currently don't have a guest, so we're just going to run the show as it is. Somebody and, might show up. Uh, yeah, we, who knows? That's fine. Someone that's fine. might show up. If not, yeah. that's fine. We'll just roll with uh, it, because we have lots of interesting stuff to talk about. Um, so let's start with uh, Ray, who wants to talk about something JS-related. Uh, yeah, you know, um, one of the things that I heard this week, a big announcement from Google, was that there is going to be a new version of Angular JS coming out, and we talked about it last week, and how in the uh, show that I just went to, the Fluent Conference, uh, Angular has gotten so much more popular since a year ago. Um, and last year, for example, there were, um, I think, something like just one big Angular JS, uh, you know, talk. And this year there were 14. And the other frameworks like, um, you know, uh, Ember and Backbone weren't as well represented. Um, so right after that, of course, you know, right when you finish doing a course on Angular, they start talking about a new version of Angular, which always drives you crazy. But um, they they did this very detailed blog post um, in uh, their website, and they talk about some of the changes that they're s sort of looking at doing. I don't think it's very far ahead yet. Uh, they're really just starting the implementation, so it's nothing that's set in stone. Um, as a matter of fact, they say we're still in design and prototyping, so some of these things are not going to happen this way. Um, and... Um, one of the interesting things is that they're really focusing on mobile as the target for this, um, you know, for this uh, version of um, Angular. And so I thought that was kind of weird because Angular is more of like a back-end sort of engine. Uh, gives you like the model view controller architecture, which just lets you separate. Like it, it gives you, for example, the ability to create templates. It lets you the, gives you the ability to like import data into a template and then control it with JavaScript. And so I don't know that it's exactly made for mobile, but it's something that they're really focusing on. So performance things, making it more modular. Um, they're also, another thing that's kind of interesting is they're also targeting ES6. So some, I know I'm scrolling a lot here, but somewhere <laughs> it says um, that they're actually going to be uh, working on programming this whole thing with ES6, which is the new version of JavaScript. Uh, they're saying that they are going to still they yeah, hit ECMAScript 6, which is a new version um, of JavaScript that still hasn't sort of hit a lot of browsers. Uh, as a matter of fact, it doesn't run a on any browsers today. Um, and they're oh, going to be that's using... That's a good starting point. Yeah, I know. So they're going to be using a compiler to generate ES5 code so that when they... Re hopefully when they release this, it'll obviously be backwards compatible but they're looking at dropping support for a lot of browsers. So if you look at the set that they're that they're thinking about supporting, um, they're supporting like IE11, and I, I'm not sure how many people are using. Oh come now! Everyone yeah. with, IE, with 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 <laughs> everyone with Windows 8.1 has IE11. Yeah, so uh, that, you know that's I a am... large majority of Windows users. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, I'm really hoping that this is something that comes out in a few years, maybe, because I think they're really pushing the envelope. I don't know that we're quite ready for some of these things. Like, pushing ECMAScript 6, I think, is really daring. I don't, I don't know that people are going to know how to program with ECMAScript 6. And, th you know, they're saying that you don't really, they don't really expect people to do that. They're, they're still going to allow you to work with ES5 if you want to, if you don't want to upgrade. But this just means that they're sort of pushing you towards a new version of JavaScript, which has things like classes and things that, I don't know, I feel a little weird about. I don't, I'm, I'm not a really... I love the way that JavaScript um, just lets you do things really quick. Um, I was watching, so for example, like a... I'm so sorry, go ahead. Are they making it a little bit more object-oriented in its approach? 
Yes, uh, Egg Mix so they're making you, So they're making you scope variables. They're uh, making yeah. 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 That kind you know, of this, you know, I, I really I really can't stand that. Well, it reminds me honestly of of a change that I went through when back when Flash changed from ActionScript two to ActionScript three. Yeah. ActionScript two was a lot like JavaScript is today. It was just this open prototyping language. You could declare anonymous functions and variables whenever you wanted to, and put anything into them that you wanted. You didn't have to type them. And then when ActionScript three came along, I felt like I was being put into a pair of handcuffs when I mm. coded in it. But I, I will, I will, I will say this though. Once I started using it. I began to really appreciate it because number one, it was the first time I'd done anything class-based, and I was blown away by how powerful that was. Mm. And number two, um, one of the amazing things to me was how much cleaner my code became because it forced a discipline on me that I wasn't forcing on myself. So I actually kind of liked it. I'm not going to say that I'm not saying the same thing's going to happen when we go from ES5 to ES6. Um, but it's a similar situation, and uh, don't knock it. It might turn out to be you know, a blessing in the skies for you. Yeah, I definitely think it'll be a good move forward, and it, you know, it's going to have a, you know, classes built in, which JavaScript doesn't currently have, and it's not that you're going to have to use them, but there's going to be just a lot of people kind of sort of moving you towards, I think, that direction, which yeah. I think JavaScript, the way that it is, it's fine. Like, it, it's a beautiful thing. The ability to be flexible. Uh, you know, I was I was looking at a course on Java because I'm doing this master's class and I'm having to take like object-oriented Java core, a programming course on object-oriented Java. And I was, of course, I went to Lynda.com and I look at David David Gassner's course on Java. And if you look at like his Hello World application, it's yeah. just like an insane amount of setup <laughs> to have like a browser say hello, not even a browser, just a terminal say right. hello world. A crazy folder structure, and you have to make sure that you capitalize things properly. And you know, I just oh. think that some of those. I mean, I don't. I don't think some of those things are going to be in ES ECMAScript six, but right. I just think that 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 well, I don't know that way of thinking drives me crazy. Well, here's one of the things that I've always wondered about JavaScript, though. You know, one of the reasons that we have so many libraries out there, like Angular and Backbone and Ember and Node and jQuery and all these things, is that JavaScript really lacks structure that other languages have, so people have to build, build it into it. Is it necessarily a bad thing that JavaScript might be getting some of these primitives to help us you know, do things that we're having to use libraries to do now? Because you say that JavaScript is simple, but in order to do something complex, you have to use these libraries, or else it would, you'd just spend an enormous amount of time coding all this stuff from scratch. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. I, yeah, I don't know. So I, I have like mixed feelings about the change in Angular JS because it's going to push, I think, these other frameworks to look at some of the things that they're doing, and it's going to push people towards perhaps maybe a more class-based system and definitely a more mobile architecture. You know. You know, I think they're just thinking about it right now and seeing right. kind of what what everybody thinks about it and, and where they're going to go. So hopefully they, they keep it as awesome as it is right now. If they you, had to, if you had to guess, Ray, when would you say that, that ECMAScript 6 is going to be something that people need to start paying attention to? Or what point along the timeline yeah. do you think people are going to start to say, hey, this is something I need to look for? You know, I think probably... I would, oh, man, this is tough. I would probably say, like, next year... It's going to be really important for you to know what the differences are, um, just in preparation for some more browsers getting support, um, and really for browsers getting support. Period. Um, but it's been a couple of years since this thing has been announced, and you haven't yeah. really seen a lot of a, a lot of push towards it. So you need to know about it maybe next year, but you're not going to really see it implemented um, unless you're using like a transcompiler, like this tracer that they're that they're going to be working with. Because um, you know it's not something that is going to be targetable in a lot of browsers for a while. Hey, that sounds like a really good Ray Vigilobos first look Linda.com course. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, right. Next year. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Hey, Ray. Uh, yeah. It's a slightly off to the side of this topic, but um, I. What's with this use of the term ECMAScript? Instead of the name JavaScript. <laughs> I, so yeah, ECMA is like that the, makes no sense. So ECMA is the organization that puts the standard together, 
and I can't remember what it means, but uh, it has some sort of name. It's a standards group that defines the language. So ECMC, whatever, ECMA is um, sort of the, it's sort of like JPEG. It's That's Joint right. Photographers something, whatever, or... Joint what Photographic there? Experts Group. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, whatever you call it, an acronym or... Correct me if I'm wrong. Is. And if you ever, if you ever um, think that uh, the W3C's standards are terrible and hard to read, go read an ECMAScript standard, and you will, <laughs> and you will, you will bless the W3C. <laughs> yeah, I think the the WC3 standards are getting like I think easier to read. I don't know. Yeah, they're yeah, definitely easier know. than anything. Yeah, anything. Well, I, I actually tried to go read the ECMAScript language specification, and my head exploded about twenty minutes into it. <laughs> That's very cool. All right, yeah, so I have some other... find the definition of it, like what it means. It's just oh. when you read the history, because, you know, this is actually really confusing for people. When they when they hear about, oh, and then it's going to run the new ECMAScript, which which is JavaScript or Java, just under a different name for no apparent reason. But well, when it's, it trips, it's, it's not called JavaScript and not, but it's almost it's, the same, not quite. So it's not. It's I not really the, the same point. thing, yeah. Except ECMAScript as a shipped product is JavaScript. That's no. where it gets confusing. Correct. No. Yeah. No. ECMAScript is a standard for yeah, which right. language for which languages can be built on, which JavaScript is based off that standard. There are other ECMAScript languages as yeah, well. Yeah, I understand that. But like when you talk to let's say someone who's talking about um, Canvas and how you can do all the fancy crap in Canvas, they'll often say, Oh, Canvas is running ECMAScript, and they're just doing it to sound fancy. But sure. it's confusing to people who start out. So it's important for people to understand yeah. that when Ray is talking about ECMAScript 6, it doesn't mean there's something completely new. It means there's right. a new standard that will be implemented as something else under a more common name. Right? Which will be JavaScript, I mean. By yes. the way, Morton, you'll be happy to know that actually what ECMA stands for is the European Computer Manufacturers Association. Your peeps. That makes so no sense. No, I, well, I totally agree. With you. It actually sounds like a club that meets once a week, if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you read, it. you know, when in doubt, go to Wikipedia. JavaScript was originally developed by Brendan Eich of yes. Netscape under the name Mocha, later LiveScript, and finally renamed to JavaScript. You should really look into the history of that because it's very freaky. It is. Um, well, you know, how they is. named it, like why they named it JavaScript and how it became LiveScript and Microsoft and Microsoft's involvement in that is super, like it's amazing. It's amazing that it just survived. I got, to, of coffee. I, got to, I got to meet him one time at a W Max in a very, in a very uh, it was a very weird thing because he just happened to be with some people that I happened to be with and we just kind of co-mingled there for a little while. And I didn't even realize who he was until somebody introduced. <laughs> oh my god! Introduced it. Well, it was funny because it was friend. Hey, how's it going, man? And we just talked for a little while, and then and it dawned on me who he was. Yeah. And I just had this whole sense while I was sitting there going, I can't believe this guy across from me invented JavaScript. It was yeah. the most bizarre thing that something, and, and it's got to be bizarre for him too because I mean, it was it was a project that he was working on for I think it was what was it Netscape or CompuServe at the time something like Netscape, that. Netscape, Netscape, yeah. So uh, so he was working on it for those guys, you know, and and, uh, and he's just like, hey, you know, this is a little thing I threw together, it, but it's taken over the web. So it was, yeah. it was amazing to, to to sit and talk to this yeah, guy. He, and it's interesting to live in an, in an industry or work in an industry where the people that created all the things that we use are still walking around. That's true. I, I when I went to university, let's see, this must have been in 1998, I think. Uh, I took a computer class, and it was Java, like a Java class, and I was told in the class, well, there's this thing called JavaScript. There's this trivial thing that will probably not matter, and it's basically to run like Java in, in the browser. But you know, it's it's not it's not going to be anything it, big. So just remember that not. there's this thing called JavaScript. It wasn't even that. It had nothing to do with Java at all whatsoever. Yeah, it was like an other they, thing. And they were they were very yeah. careful about, like, these are two different things, so ignore anything that says JavaScript on it. <laughs> Let's focus on the Java. Yeah, he uh, and Brendan always keynotes the uh, Fluent Conference, so it's always nice to see him. I, I'm not, like, I haven't hung out with him, like James, which would be really, really weird. It'd be weirder that, that, that when, like... Weird. When I run into like Linda, I feel probably the same way. Like at the, you know, when I go to Carp and Linda's like around me, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's there's Linda. Anyways, 
Um, <laughs> so he always keynotes the conference. And what was interesting this year that he mentioned was that um, the Unreal Engine is being ported to JavaScript. Mm -hmm. I heard um, that, yeah. And he made, did a demo of it. It was pretty amazing, pretty unbelievable. Just, I mean, if you if he didn't tell you, it would look just like any other amazing like Xbox 3D game. So it's come a long way. It's definitely come a long way. So another thing that I have, and I, I want to know if you... This is sort of my uh, Burning Man thing that I'm doing this year, how oh, James God. did. I'm going to, for the first time <laughs> ever... You go to Burning Man? Didn't you, didn't you go to Burning Man? No, I go to Coachella. You look like the kind of person. I just look like a cat. Just, okay, whatever. Yeah. So I'm going to make a con, which is Sweet. a big... Uh, conference for total nerds like me uh, in Orlando. And look, Stan Lee's going to be there. Now, I'm not going to say him. not burning men. Not burn. That's <laughs> I know. I mean, um, I'm not going to pay the 200 bucks to see um, Stan Lee, unfortunately. So, well, But this will be my yeah, very first. You have to pay 200 extra dollars to meet Stan yeah, Lee. Yeah, to go meet Stan Lee, dude. Yeah, oh, and he's just going to, like, sign cool. your autograph and everything. But, you know, who cares? I mean, they always have a lot of geeky things. Um, and uh, I'm going to sort of try to cobble together some kind of, like, um, Captain America outfit, as you guys know I have. That was going to be my next question, was what were you going to cosplay <laughs> as? Because I right. know you're doing it. <laughs> That's right. So that should be super exciting. I mean, I know it's super exciting to me, um, and I've never gone to one, but I've always heard about them. I think I was sort of like a nerd before they became popular, so I've never felt sort of comfortable um, you know, going to one, you know, but um, they said I had to get, I had to dress up as something because otherwise I would be an outcast, which is really weird because it's like, you know, that would be the place you would want to be maybe an outcast. Yeah, you don't want the nerds to throw you out of the, the I know, <laughs> that, that would be you like the can, ultimate. You don't want that. You can go as like the new Normcore guy. Normcore? What Have you heard that? of this? No. Yeah. It's like the, uh, you know how I don't know if you remember this, but back in the 90s when grunge became popular, I think Vogue had a feature article about how to be grunge, and they were like talking about all the clothes and the styles. Yeah. And it was such a fundamental misunderstanding of the whole concept, and it became like a really big joke about like anytime you see a documentary about grunge era, you'll see references to that Vogue article and how idiotic it was. So right now, all these fashion magazines are trying to make normcore into a thing. And normcore is basically dressing up as Jerry Seinfeld. You know, <laughs> high water pants, ugly shoes, like dressing down and like looking really slobby and basically, you know, looking like you really, really don't care. And it's so funny because everyone's like, what is this normcore trend that's going on? And the hipsters are all going normcore. And I'm like, God, that oh, means man. I'm actually going to have to start taking this up. That this means that I'm going to have to actually start taking care of myself so that people don't think I'm trying to do that. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> right. God. I wonder if, like, if I see a bunch of people like like that tomorrow, I'll be going, yeah. hey, way to go, and uh, what is it, Nordcore or whatever? Normal. Like, oh, what are you talking normal about? Core. Oh, normal, okay. Yeah, normal. I wonder core. if they would be like, what the heck are you talking about, man? You know, <laughs> kicked out or something, so... Hmm. That no, I'm cool. looking for it. I mean, I, I'm I always which, I've always wanted to see like the 501st, which is the group of people that dress up as uh, Star Wars clones. Star Wars troopers, yeah, yeah. 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 And you know what? You, you've got to come up. You can, you can't just go as Captain America. You got to mix characters together. That's the really yeah. successful things. Like I saw I saw a guy that mixed Hello Kitty and Darth Vader one time. That was, <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, Wait, so you like need the, to, pink, the pink Darth Vader. Yeah, yeah, we and he had Hello Kitty decals all over him. It was it was awesome. So you need to you need to come up with a Captain America mashup. Captain America oh, slash yeah. Sailor Moon. Yeah, yeah, that would be yeah. or or uh, Ultraman and Captain America mixed together. You know, man, you guys just blew so my a, mind. Captain so, Ultra America. That sounds pretty cool. There it is. There it is. That's it. That's it. Pull it up again. Pull it up again. There it is. The hell yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, that that is something else. Yeah, I don't think I have the budget for that much nerd nerdosity there. I mean, there's like a female version over here. That's yeah. interesting. 
So yeah, <laughs> James. <laughs> oh, check out check out the little guys. It's so cute. Oh, that's so, adorable. Are you bringing your camera? Uh, you know, I was debating, but I mean, I really should, right? You have to. I we really have to see to. pictures. Yeah, definitely. We'll we'll uh, we'll. I'll bring my camera. I bought my my daughter's going with me, and I bought her a Dalek costume, so that should be pretty cool. Nice. So this would be the perfect uh, type of scenario to wear Google Glass, I would say. Oh, that would be that would be cool. Too bad I don't have one. I didn't yeah. have the fifteen hundred bucks for that either. <laughs> we we one. need a budget for these things, guys. We need like it's sponsors. Like, yeah, I know mean, we do. Tape we a camera to your head and just walk <laughs> around. Yeah. That would be funny. You could cosplay as Google Glass. Get a pair of safety glasses. And <laughs> tape like a GoPro to the side. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> put a Google logo on it. That'd be great. Very cool. Uh, yeah. So James, you've been uh, tinkering I with. Uh, I cannot follow that up. Uh, yeah, I got. A, I got. A, a, well, I've got a couple of things. Um, one, uh, Netflix. Uh, I want to revisit that subject. Um, uh-huh. In a recent article on Ars Tecana, it uh, they admit that they are going to pay off other ISPs, and if this doesn't send a chill throughout the net, it should. I saw um, that yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really really sad, and I love this quote um, from the uh, from the Netflix CEO. He says, um, you know, ISPs sometimes point to data showing that Netflix members account for about 30% of peak residential internet traffic, which is amazing in and of itself. It's incredible. So the ISPs want us to share in their costs, but they don't also offer for Netflix or similar services to share in the ISP's revenue. So cost sharing for us makes no sense. When an ISP sells a consumer a 10 or 50 megabits per second internet package, the consumer should get that rate no matter where the data is coming from, and that is so true. So I'm curious as to why they're not fighting this more. They seem to just... Well, if they're going to pay off more ISPs, because, I mean, once that precedent has been set, then almost every CDN out there is going to have to start paying off ISPs. I mean, a lot of them can show Netflix being a special thing and saying, well, you know, it counts for so much traffic, and you know, we're just getting bombarded with Netflix. Yeah. But what about so the Netflix, Netflix, them? right? Yeah. Oh, and, and, and then how far does it go? You know, how far does it extend down? I mean, it, what, if, what if you, Morton, uh, were to create a site that had really interesting videos of Scandinavian uh, log cutting on it, and that mm-hmm. suddenly just took off, and everybody wanted to watch Scandinavian log cutting. Yeah. Um, you know, all of a sudden... we do it from the other side. I, well, I know, I've heard. So, so all of a sudden, here comes Comcast. It yeah. says, Morton, great site you got there. Would, hate, would be ashamed to see it go under. You should be ashamed to see it throttled, you know? Yeah, so uh, this is this is really interesting because I, I read that article you're talking about, and what's happening is they're not throttling the uh, what does it call it the last mile the right no they're not that's exactly right from from you your like from your house to whatever ISP you're using right they're throttling um, they're throttling um, Netflix before it gets to that point so they're saying. Right. You, you can't input the volume of content you're doing into our system. So right. we'll distribute whatever we get, but we're going to limit how much you can put into our system. And um, that sounds to me like a very legalistic attempt at circumventing the laws that are in place. Now you have to keep in mind the current laws of net neutrality or whatever they're called in the States, uh, yeah. are, they were scrapped last year. Um, and there's a process of trying to make something new, and there's a big fight between the ISPs who want less control and the uh, service providers like Netflix and Amazon and everyone else who want more control. So they basically want to say that right. all bits are cre- created equal. It doesn't matter what type of content is being shipped. Um, this is a huge, very serious problem. And the you know, like with most everything else when it comes to the web, whatever the United States does will become precedent setting for other countries like Canada. Um, and you know, that in itself is really disturbing because you could end up in a situation where, yeah, you would have to like the, the, the end result of this would be, hey, you have Netflix, then you have to pay an extra ten dollars a month to get premium service. Right. Um, just to get the content in. So in addition to paying Netflix, you're also paying your ISP just for that access. And there's a transparent reason why they're doing it. And that's just, 
this is part of the reason why it's so evil. Uh, you'll notice that this uh, throttling is specifically happening uh, towards video streaming services, and that's because the cable provider that gives you the internet also gives you TV, and they have their own video services that they want you to use in place of Netflix. So they have their own video on demand and all that crap, and of right. course their model is garbage, so no one wants to pay the money for it. I mean, I can rent a movie off Google Play and pay half of what I do to rent the same movie off uh, Shaw, which is what I use for internet, no, for cable. So why on right. earth would I pay Shaw? And then they're arguing, well, you know, uh, our quality is better, and I'm like, you're just crazy. That's that is simply not true. <laughs> you're you're just selling the same product at a much higher cost. Why would I ever pay for this product, right? And, and honestly, I would have far less problem with this if the um, ISPs themselves weren't so monopolistic in terms mm-hmm. of their their areas. They're so anti com- competition when it comes to each other. Uh, I used a, a service called Comporium, which nobody else outside of the st- upstate South Carolina has ever even heard of, uh, because they successfully blocked Time Warner, Comcast, and everybody from coming in and competing against them. So I have to pay what they ask me to pay for their crappy service. Uh, you guys can see the picture on my Google Hangout, so you kind of know uh, how good my connection is. Um, and it's it's one of those things where it's just like, okay, um, if if you open it up to competition and allowed me as a consumer to choose whichever ISP, then okay, if one of you wants to charge Netflix a little more, that's fine because that cost wouldn't get passed on to me. Yeah. You know? And, and, it's, uh, and I could pick a better plan. There, there are a lot of facets to this. Another very interesting component of it is it, this doesn't apply to the United States because you guys are all crazy, but for the rest of the world, there Thank are, you. like the rest of the Western world, they have rules in place that say things like um, there are certain channels, like if you can put an aerial up, and get a station, yeah. then that station must also be available for free through the cable. So you don't have to keep switching. And the quality of those stations have to be comparable. Otherwise, you're less, like, if you charge money for something that's free, then you're doing a disservice. Right. Now, uh, in Canada, there's a huge battle going on right now because the cable providers um, are currently actually paying those stations for the to re, redistribute their content, which honestly is fair, because it's like you're taking something that's free and pushing it to other people and charging money for it. So then, at least the people who produce that content should get paid something. Now the cable providers are now trying to uh, ban, like throw out that law so they don't have to pay. So basically, what they're saying is, I want to redistribute content and sell it, but I don't want to give money to the originator. And what will happen if they do that is they'll sink the originators because that's their income, right? Right. Um, so there's a and, and that's like the same in many European countries and everything. So there there's um the internet providers and the cable providers have a very distorted worldview where they claim that the delivery of content in its in and of itself, if the content has a higher value, then it should cost more to deliver it. Um, it would be almost like if you send a letter and you say there's something important in the letter, then it costs more than if you say this letter is trivial and I don't really care. It'll still be delivered, but because of the importance of the content within that letter, you have to pay more. Not in a, and you can say like priority mail. No, no, no. If it's the same exact service, the only right. difference is what's in it, right? Yeah. It's preposterous, and it's um, it's something that's going to impact us, everyone who uses the internet, because when you publish content, your content is basically sold to anyone who visits it through an ISP. They're selling your content and not giving you a kickback for what they earn. And they are so rich. And they have such... They have such monopolistic control over everything. I mean, I I tweeted out a couple of weeks ago that it seems like the end... the end game of uh, American-style capitalism is monopoly. (laughs) Because if you look at... If you look at how it works, every single system, like banks, uh, ISPs, cable companies, all end up as monopolies. Because basically, if one company grows bigger, and then when they have competition, instead of dealing with it and improving their service, they just buy out the competition and kill it, or just you know uh, do a hostile takeover or something to just eat it. And you end up with these very harsh monopolies, and you can't shut them down because you've already put in place rules that say that there can't be government intervention and it's a free market where the market controls everything. There's no market control. It's a monopoly. 
well, if I you have a monopoly, then there's no market control. I, I got news but for you. you. Think... We don't exactly have a free market here in the United States. There's, there's heavy regulation on everything, unfortunately. Mm. Well, the regulation that you guys have... It's is rigged in favor of the businesses. Yes, it's a right. joke. Go look at what happens across the pond, and you'll realize that when you put in regulation that is for the consumer, it actually works really well. When you put in a regulation that's pro-business, then it just ends up screwing over the consumer, and you end up with monopolies on everything. So, All right, In defense of the economy and the American way of life, I have to say, <laughs> it seems to work pretty well for us. I mean, you know, there's a lot of... Yeah, you currently have so. four major TV providers that provide all the rest of information world. content, and they're all the exact same. So you get one side of every story. Every single news outlet covers one side of the story. Every single... Everything in the United States is so skewed. No. Now, Morton, you, you're, you're you're veering. You're you're. I know. You're I mean, veering. you got to calm down, man. <laughs> you, you're, uh, I, oh my God. <laughs> I'm just saying. You know. So if you watch MSNBC and then you go watch Fox News, yeah. tell me they're covering the same story. Right? If you take MSNBC and Fox News and put them on a European scale, they're both hard right. Oh my God. No, I'm not joking. Holy cow. Only the political yeah. scale. They're both MSNBC. Have like you watched that MSNBC? The center or left of center? Jesus. Uh, okay. Anyways, uh, you know I think that sometimes Shady I think that's... wouldn't think that MSNBC was far right. Good Lord, man. Right on. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, I think that uh, maybe we should switch the conversation. I think we just we just lost our remaining viewers right there. Yeah. They all, they all I, just guess, I have the something. I have something really cool I want to show you guys. Okay. Um, so. Yeah, um, let me you, let like, me start by saying first. sometimes I think that code can be art. And the first time I ever encountered that was when I accidentally followed a link on the web and landed on this. And I, you might have seen this. Um, it looks like this. Have you seen this before? Oh, wow. That's cool. No. What it's heck? actually quite famous. And this looks like crap. And the, the URL is 9w's.jodi.org. Of course. Um, now, the reason why this is cool is because if I go here and I go uh, view source, I need to click option control U, is it? Yes. That's what it looks like when you view the source. Oh, much nice. prettier. It's actually graphics. Uh, and it's. It's just yeah. ASCII art. It's just ASCII art, but yeah. it's actually kind of interesting because it's like, this is schematic for something. I don't know quite what it is. Actually, I figured out what it is. It's rather I think disturbing. It, uh, didn't, didn't Jodie Foster build this in a movie <laughs> one time? <laughs> and then she went back and saw her dad. I think that was it. Oh, Contact, yes. Yeah, that was it, so, right? This was my first encounter of code as art. And there's an actual like art piece to it where it's like you go into it and you don't understand and you have to kind of stumble on the fact that there's something behind the scenes and everything. I like the fact that they use the blink tag. tag. Yeah. Look at that blink <laughs> tag, man. Back. Oh, yeah. It doesn't blink anymore, though, because the blink tag doesn't it work. It doesn't work on Yeah, you're right. It's uh, little, if yeah. you go back to an older browser, it will, yeah. it will annoy the hell out of you. <laughs> so um, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because um, I'm seeing this very strong intersection between uh, art and code now. And uh, one example of that is this huge thing that's happening in Vancouver right now. So I say, that's not really art. That's not really code, though. Well, just wait. So yeah. the, the um, uh, TED conference is happening in Vancouver right now. I and, love this woman's work. I'm just going to go outside I love, of the love tech her work. Janet Eckelman and Aaron Colbin ha Koblin have put up this enormous, very very large installation, and it's like when you, it, it's impossible to explain how big it is. It's like suspended between um, a huge like 40 story building and yeah. the whole convention center, and uh, I, I don't know actually how big it is, but it's enormous. The reason why I'm saying it's code is because this thing, um, it's basically a net that's being suspended, and then they have five projectors that are shooting uh, a Chrome browser on the net. And you can go there and log in to the website um, and then use a, an app on your phone and just poke at it or swirl your hand around, and that'll create sounds, and it'll also display stuff onto this net. 
So you see, like in the picture here, you see the colors are changing and everything. And mm -hmm. it's powered by all this crazy stuff. So you have the Chrome browser, which is what's being displayed, and it's just a browser window. Uh, they're using Go uh, as, as a programming language. It's powered by WebGL. They use nice. WebSockets to pass the information directly from your phone up to the thing immediately. Uh, there's web audio on it, so when on when you're messing with it on your phone, the phone is making sounds and playing it back to you. So it's like yeah, a oral experience, and uh, the whole thing is built on Polymer. So this is like a Google very that extreme is crazy. Project. That is crazy cutting edge, man. That's yeah. a lot of like very Absolutely. awesome technologies. So well, unfortunately, the interactive simulation doesn't actually work. It just says coming oh, soon. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, there's an, if you go to this website, so it's called Unnumbered Sparks. That's the name of the art piece. And if you go to unnumberedsparks.com and you play the video, you'll see like there they explain the whole process of how it was built and everything. So now all my friends are going down there and taking pictures. So this is Fell. He took a picture yesterday. So here you see like these circles are people poking at it. And the lines that you see, like there's a swirl line right here, is someone dragging their finger across the screen. So wow. the whole thing is, the whole thing is hyper interactive, and there can be like a thousand people interacting with it at the same time. Um, here's uh, Kenny was also there. He took uh, some pictures. So oh no, sorry, the other one was Kenny's. This is Phil. So you see, like there's all this interactive stuff going on constantly, and it changes all the time. Uh, so there's no, there's no. It doesn't look like one thing. It interacts. So sure. this is, you know, like Ray said, extremely cutting edge and very interesting in this concept of having uh, an art piece become interactive through code. Now, Google has a big part in this, and I think that it's because of this thing that they launched a couple of, mm -hmm. I think a month ago, that's called DevArt. So um, it's a contest. It's almost done, but I'm sure they're going to do it again. And what they're doing is they're trying to make developers start to make art uh, using code. And if you go to this website, it's just devart.withgoogle.com, and you look at some of these projects, uh, one of the requirements of the project is you have to put it on GitHub so that people can see your source code. Mm -hmm. And people are doing crazy, crazy things. It's really neat to see like how people are taking code elements and baking them into art to do things you just cannot do uh, in like a regular installation and making them hyper interactive and then also making it so that once they've done it, other people can take part of it and do it for, use something else or people can contribute to the code piece itself. So there's every single one of these pieces has like a full explanation of what happened with links directly to GitHub, links to all the libraries used, uh, videos of the process. So this is, um, this is an art piece that basically takes a JPEG and then it makes a 3D visual that shows the color space in a 3D environment. So you load up the image, and then you see the pieces that uh, the colors that appear within the image. So you see the it gets nice. right. Um, and there's just tons of these. This is a video. This is um, a musical instrument type thing where you they display a grid onto a touch screen, and then you can um, let's see if I can jump forward here. You can. You know, the screen itself interacts. Uh, it's using a leap motion to interact with it. If you play the video with the audio, you can hear it's crazy. It's like they can make sounds with it. It's, it's just so cool. <laughs> so uh, there's, you know, a lot of technology behind this. Uh, and I'm, I'm seeing like, they're, they're using VVVV and processing and pretty much everything under the sun to make all this work. Um, but I truly think that. Uh, now that Google is involved in it and trying to get developers to think about their code in as more than just something you write an application with, I have high hopes for the art world really embracing code and making more interactive things and also making art more accessible through uh, interactive elements. So. Man, that makes me feel sad for the art that we have like locally here in our like parks and stuff. Like really well, cheesy art. I, I would, I would actually say that, um, uh, you know, this is definitely not a new thing. I've seen stuff like this, you know, a lot in processing as a language was created, yeah. you know, to help to help foster artwork and, and create artwork. And uh, you know, the the sculpture you showed at the beginning, uh, Janet, I think her name was name is Eichelman or something yeah. like that. I've been a fan of hers for a while. I, what I love about her artwork, she was inspired. She she went on a trip one time. She went on this retreat to do to do painting, and 
all her paints and things like that didn't make it to customs, so she didn't have any anything to work with. But the local fishermen, she went out there, and they were casting nets, and she yeah. thought the nets and the shapes were so beautiful that that's what she sort of picked it up as a medium uh, and kind of went on with it. So her work is, is just stunning, amazing. She, I mean, you, sh you should see. If you like that one, take a look at a bunch of her. her different well, yeah, ones. Even in, but even in like the city, the city of Charlotte, near, you know, near uh, where I live, um, basically, there is a building downtown. Um, the, the name of the building is Touch My Building, and mm -hmm. it, it has art. Or it's a, it's actually a parking deck that has all this retail on the bottom of it. But there are these panels up on the building, and if you touch them, they light up and they play music and they play sounds. And there's a puzzle on the side of the building that's in binary code, and if you solve it and you touch the panels, and you have to walk all the way around the building to do this, but if you touch them in the right order, then the entire building lights up and plays music. And the artist who lives in Maryland has this tied into his um, to a website, and whenever it's solved, he goes and resets the puzzle so that you have to solve it again. Ah. So, it's, it's, so it's really it's really interesting. I love stuff like this. I mean, I'm, I love the fact, I mean, Joshua Davis, are you familiar with his work? Yeah. Yeah, so his he's been doing stuff like this forever, and I remember at Max one year there was this huge touchscreen table thing they had sitting out in the middle of it, and you could come up and play with it, and the artwork that was being created, um, you know, would respond to your touch events, and it would you know swirl and do all these patterns on the stuff, and it was being broadcast up on the big screen um, during the keynote, and there was all this really cool stuff that you could do do with it. I love artwork that inter and that involves the end user. That involves people in a way that is that is interactive, and code is essential to doing that. So, but I think this stuff is is amazing. Frankly. It's just I think um, this uh, dev art thing that Google's doing. They're really trying to get people who don't think about art to start thinking about art. Because for a lot of people, art is just you know. You go to the museum and you look at one of these paintings from the 18th, 1800s or 1700s or 1500s, and it's, you know, boring and stagnant and doesn't really change. You can't touch it, right? And then they're trying to get people who are more in the technical field to realize, hey, there's all these cool things you can do. And when you look at what's being done, um, a lot of it is very basic, but you can see how once a developer has gotten their hands on it and made some cool library that can do something, an artist can then go and work with that developer to make it into like a real art piece, and you get this intersection, which is what you have here. You have um, uh, the uh, this woman artist who made the net, and then you have a Google developer who made that projection on it, and without the developer side, it wouldn't be that interesting. Without the art side, it would also not be that interesting, because one of the really neat things about that net is right now for whatever reason we have really windy weather it's extremely windy and that whole thing f moves a lot because it's huge right so it waves and like bucks and jumps up and down and the projections get all distorted because of it right because it's moving and the projections are coming up from down under so the the art piece in itself and its interaction with the climate is making you know this individual pieces that only happen for a fraction of a second that will never be recreated. So it's this very interesting experience. <laughs> cool. I would also uh, encourage you to check out um, and I always I always just murder his name, but Seb Lee Delisle. Lee Delisle. Yeah, thank you, Delisle. Thank you. I lo I always tear his name up. Um, but he does these things. He's, he, his installations keep getting bigger and bigger. He did like these digital fireworks uh, on the side of a building. Um, but uh, he has a, a site called creativejs.com um, that has a lot of really cool things, uh, particle systems that people are building with JavaScript and things like that. So um, I highly recommend checking his stuff out too. It's, it's incredible. So if you're a developer, you are also an artist. You just don't know it yet. <laughs> well, that's all I got. That was good. That was better than your other rant, though, <laughs> of the capitalist system here that we yeah. love. Yeah. <laughs> Long live the U.S., oh, man. On. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Your, and your, your commie rant took all my GitHub time, too. So, so maybe I'll talk about Git. I'll talk about GitHub next time. Maybe yeah, we'll talk about GitHub next time. I'll try to find, because I've referred to something before we got on the show, and I'll try to actually find it so you can take a look at it, because I think... Right. Uh, GitHub oh, for designers is definitely something we need to cover in uh, great which, detail. 
uh, everybody out there listening, if there's anybody still left, uh, I will be recording this week coming up. I'll be doing I'm doing GitHub for web designers. I'm really, am, really looking forward to doing that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that course. Just to, you know, I think it's going to be a really good thing for people to uh, to look at, and you're the perfect person for it. Yeah. Ooh, I don't know about that, but we'll see. I concur. I so. We all agree. Wow. <laughs> all right. Um, I think we can wrap at this point. I think we can. Yes. <laughs> uh, that is full time for author content. Thank you all for watching. Uh, we'll be back here next week uh, doing talking about more stuff and doing more interesting things. Thanks to my two co-hosts, James Williamson. Avowed capitalist. Ray Vigilobos. Right on. <laughs> Long live the capitalist revolution, yes. And uh, with that... <laughs> I'm going to get you a red star for your shirt next week. Yeah. Yeah, I'll wear my Lennon shirt just to... <laughs> uh, and with that, I'm going to say good night. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. To be good continued. Luck. Good luck, everybody. <laughs>